Where are they? What's the date today? It's uh, March 6th, right? And this is the season of uh, <coughs> of Lent. Hmm. Where are they? Where are who? The aliens? No. Where are who? The Christians? Oh, they're all over. But where are they? Where are who? Where are the people who so vehemently and adamantly defended your God-given rights to yoke yourself up with the Roman Catholic Church for one day to defend that? Where are they to defend this season? Where are they to defend Easter? Hmm? Easter is coming. Where are they? Where are you who called saved people lost? Where are you who caused needless, stupid division amongst the body of Christ, the church of the living God? Where are you now? To defend people's God-given right to yet again yoke themselves up with the Vatican. Where are you? Where are you? Tough guy? Hmm? Where are you? To the Roman Catholic Church. There are two significant days. And hey, you Catholics, come on, tell me. Tell me, we because we know this is the truth, that there are two days that the Catholic is obligated to get to a phallus house and or also to go to the Jesuit confessional. There are two days that they are required to. And what are those two days? Astarte and Christ's Mass. Those are the two biggest days to Catholicism. Some would like to argue, well, no, the Assumption of Mary and other things. No, 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 yeah, 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 those are all because Catholic Catholicism has a myriad of holy days. Okay, but the two big daddies, the two big mamas, I should say, to the Catholic, the two big ones are Easter and Christ's Mass. Ooh, spiritual and temporal, huh? Where are you now? Hmm? Where are you now, I wonder, to come out in defense of Easter? Hmm? Well, and here's the argument. And, and this, this is a true argument. Well, Easter is pagan. You're right. You're right. Yes, it is. But Christ's Mass isn't, huh? Here's the problem that you have. If you were to start to come out in defense of Easter, then that would pretty much show the world who you really work for. Wouldn't it? And see, a majority of these people who caused all this stink over a satanic Roman Catholic holiday called Christ's Mass, see, they're smarter than that. Okay? They're smarter than that. Because if they were to come out and to defend your God-given right to uh, celebrate Astarte Easter, it's like, wait a minute, buddy. That's quite pagan. Just like Christ's Mass is. But then again, like I said, these people who do this are smarter than that. Because if they did, then that would obviously show them, show the world who they really work for. Yeah. Yeah. So again, my question is to you. Those of you who caused all the trouble, those of you who called saved people lost over a Roman Catholic created holiday, a tradition of man, where are you? Where are you? 
Because remember, scripturally, now the word Easter is in scripture. Uh, we're going to briefly touch on that. We're going to briefly touch on that. Um, but, you know, we are commanded in scripture to remember what? The death of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at that as well. Okay? Nowhere in scripture are we commanded to commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ. Okay, and people like to tie that in with the cute little, you know, the manger scene and whatnot. And there's the first Christ's mass. <laughs> pagans, you wicked pagans. No, no, no. But where are you for Easter? Which is supposedly based upon, according to Catholicism, is based upon the death, burial, and resurrection, which the death, burial, uh, do this in remembrance of me, which we are commanded in Scripture to commemorate, and we do that in the means of communion. Communion is going to be the main topic of this video, but there are some things that we have to go through before we get to this, because uh, Catholicism, you know, with their blessed cookie, uh, where the Jesuit priest, you know, uh, does his woo hoo -dee -woo -dee, and turns the cookie into flesh and the wine into blood. Uh, yeah, the Catholic teaches that communion is salvific. Don't they? Don't you? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. That's what you teach in your catechism. And, um, <laughs> have you, uh, seen communion in a church building before? Now, they do differ, um, but, you know, for example, I put in the YouTube search, Woodstock, Illinois churches, okay? Do that for your locality. Uh, let's say you live in uh, 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 Gary, Indiana, say. I don't know why, but let's say you do uh, Gary, Indiana churches and see what comes up. You put in the YouTube search, Woodstock, Illinois churches, and a bunch of them will come up. And click on a few of those videos. I mean, I don't recommend you do, but I, I did. And and they all seem to follow a certain script, don't they? The, the mind control, stand up, then sit down. Stand up, sit down. The melodic music to get the unscriptural for this dispensation, tithing and offering and bless the offering. Some will do announcements. Some will do this. Then they have a watered down message. And, th and this is so stupid. You got the so-called, oh, 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 and by the way, hey, pastor, you looking at me? Hmm? Yeah, pastor, you looking at me? Ad majorium to glorium, huh, buddy? Yeah. Anyway, I you know, I've seen this on videos and stuff like this um, about where, okay, the so-called pastor will, will sit down and some other guy will go and read a Bible while he sits there. What what kind of a... Uh, but then again, some when they could now, apparently in church buildings, which are not sanctified in scripture, God does not dwell in temples made with hands, okay? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, okay? If you are truly saved, born again, converted, of the church of the living God, okay? Not a Christian. That's what people of the world called us, okay? Oh, 1 Peter, huh? Chapter 4, right? Look what the word Christian is being compared on to, okay? We never called ourselves that, dear friend, okay? But uh, if you look how the Catholics do their communion, which they teach are, are Sovithic, everyone gets the, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. The body. And then when you see supposedly a Protestant minister, Doing the same thing, it's like, <laughs> wow. Hey, pastor. Yeah, you, you, you see this? You obviously got the track I gave you. Add joy to glory, I'm, huh, buddy? Hmm. You wouldn't happen to be a Jesuit temporal coadjutor, would you? 
No. No, you wouldn't. No, no, that's crazy. That conspiracy, right? I've met before Jesuits. I've come across quite a few uh, Jesuit temporal coadjutors myself, especially here on YouTube. Yeah, that worked for the Vatican. Yeah, yeah. I smell something. I smell something. But, the, okay, forgive that little rabbit tra uh, trail there, but communion, dear friend, is not salvific. We're going to talk about that. But this thing about these two important holidays onto the Roman Catholic Church, okay? These two important holidays, the two biggest ones, like I said, that the Catholic is obligated to attend their phallus house, the church building, okay, are what? Easter and Christ's Mass. Those are the two that they are obligated to. Okay, and remember when you uh, go through the system of the Roman Catholic Church, you have a dual citizenship, spiritual and temporal. Oh, wonder about that, huh? Yeah, you have a dual citizen uh, citizenship. Do you realize, Catholic, you nominal Catholics that go to like St. Mary's here in Woodstick, okay, you know you also have citizenship of Rome? You know that? You are considered a dual citizen of Rome and your nation, but you are first loyal to Rome, aren't you? Most of you Catholics don't know that, but that is the fact, okay? That is the fact. There are going to be a lot of links for you in the description box, okay? But like I said, the two biggest holidays onto uh, Catholicism, Satan's church, are Easter and Christ's Mass, okay? And 99.9.9.9% of these so-called Christians, I'm not a Christian, by the way. I'm of the Church of the Living God, Church of God. I am a saint. Oh, see, see, that's, Catholicism has done that. You think of saint uh, as something glorified by a Catholic, but we are saints. We are saints. Am I sinless? Ha! No. No. Am I sometimes a hypocrite? Yes. Oh. Well, I'm not as perfect as some of the Brisraelites from England or certain select Canadians who never are hypocrites. You know, there you excellent bloke scum. Right? Never a hypocrite. Oh, you know, Paul uh, had moments when he was a hypocrite. Acts chapter 21. Here, let me really get you irritated. Even Peter had moments when he was a hypocrite. Oh, you want to you wanna get the shoe off in there, right? Yeah, Galatians chapter 2. Or is that Galatians chapter 1? You go find out. Huh? Huh? Am I sinless? No. Do I have moments when I'm a hypocrite? Yes. Yes, I do. Uh, when I am pointed, when the Lord or a brother or even a sister point out that hypocrisy, I repent of that and <laughs> it's like, Lord, <laughs> you know. But see, you have to have an understanding of what Romans chapter 7 is about, okay? You do, all right? But like I keep saying to you, Easter and Christ's Mass are the two big days to the Roman Catholic. Okay, and you and I as the Church of the Living God ought not to be having anything to do with those days. Now, if you are someone who is of the Church of the Living God and want to engage in Estarte and Christ's Mass, okay, I'm not going to, unlike some, I'm not going to call you lost, okay? I will have nothing to do with you. Okay, I want nothing to do with you, especially when you're engaging in paganism. I want nothing to do with you. you. That's your problem. That's between you and the Lord. You're going to have to answer for that. Okay? All right? And I'm not going to change the issue. I'm not going to switch the issue and say, well, you're against liberty. You're against liberty. Someone who says that in order to defend paganism, they truly have no concept of what liberty really is. Okay? You don't, all right? 
See, they'll twist the issue. They're against liberty. Uh, no, I'm against Catholicism. And I'm against the Catholic practices. And like I said, 99.999% of the Christians out there believe in a satanic three-person trinity. Yes, they do. The trinity that got its beginnings in Babylon. Okay? Nimrod, Semiramis, and Ninus. Okay? Was developed in Egypt. Isis, Horus, Set. Huh? The three letters of of the Jesuits. Which they tell you is what? Uh, I, Jesus, Hamador, uh, Salvatore. Hamadan, Salvatore. I always get that mixed up because I don't know Latin. But it's um, Jesus, Hamadan, Salvatore. Which means Jesus, the Savior of mankind. That's what the Catholic Jesuit tells you. That IHS stands for. No, it's Isis or Set. Okay? So the Trinity got its birth in Babylon. Got developed in Egypt. Perfected in Catholicism. You know, the old man, father, the young, uh, white, Japhethian, effeminate young man, Jesus, and the uh, Holy Ghost with the little bird that goes and poops on you with its blessings. May Lord God, my Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, spread dung over your trinity. Oh, you heard me right. You heard me right. That's what your trinity is. It's dung. Okay? But don't worry. You read the book of Revelation. The trinity will make its appearance on the earth. Yeah. What is it? The dragon, or what is it? The beast, the false, uh, the beast, uh, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Or excuse me, it's the devil, the beast. And the false prophet. There's your trinity. You go ahead and read about that in the book of Revelation. Okay? Alright? But now, get your authorized version of the scriptures. And turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures. Follow me along word for word, verse by verse at the scriptures that we will be looking at today. Follow me along. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Make sure I'm not lying to you. Follow me along because sometimes this goes a little bit quicker than this. And sometimes I skip a groove, okay? Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so, okay? All right. But Judges chapter 10, verses 10 on to verse uh, 14. Where are you now? With, uh, you know, you caused such a big stink about Christ's mass. Where are you now for a start day? Hmm? Yeah, like I said, if you did, then people would know who you really work for. <laughs> yeah. Judges chapter 10, verses 10 on to verse 14. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Baalim. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines, the Zidonians also and the Amalekites, and the Man Mawanites did oppress you, and ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me, and served other gods. Wherefore I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. And also in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 31 and verse 38. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 31 and verse 38. For their rock is not as our rock. Capital R there. Note the contract. Don't, don't be looking at me. Lord Kesar. Their, for their rock, Lord Kesar, is not as our capital R rock. Even our enemies themselves being judges. Yeah. For their vine is of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Hmm. 
Yeah, Catholic. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that they shall and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are the gods? Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted? Which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. Hmm. Verse 38. Did eat the fat of their sacrifices. And the mass is a sacrifice. Where they're sacrificing Jesus all over again. And of course the wine that the Jesuit priest, you know, does the woody woody. Turns it all, you know, the transubstantiation, right? Right, Pastor? Yeah. Hey, you might as well be wearing the little dog collar on you. Kind of like that guy. Um, thank you, sister, about that guy who thinks he's a woman and also a wolf. Oh, even so come Lord Jesus, right? Right? And now, um, gotta gotta go over this here uh, in Jeremiah chapter ten, which we can't use for instruction and in righteousness because it's about a specific thing, and you know we can't use it for instruction and in righteousness, not at all. Okay, it, it has nothing to do with us doctrinally, nor instruction and in righteousness, so we can't use it when refuting paganism. No, we can't. <clears throat> you have God said. Jeremiah 10, just one in verses 1 and 2, okay? Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord. Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. And you can go ahead and read about uh, verse 3. For the custom of the people are vain, for one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. Then you go on to read about how they deck it with gold and silver, and there are those out there, well, that is specifically talking about an idol, but it cannot be used for instruction in righteousness. <laughs> Where are you to defend a starte? Hmm? Where are you to defend a starte? Easter. Where are you? Hmm? Where are you guys? First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. Now look, okay? If you are of the church of the living God, say born again converted, and you are going to engage in Astarte and Christ's Mass, that's your problem. Okay, does that mean that you lose your salvation? It's not your salvation to lose. If you are genuinely saved, born again, converted, you came to the Lord on his terms, broken of your self-righteousness, having godly sorrow, contrition, taking responsibility, it's your fault that he died on the cross, you put him on the cross, and having the fear of the Lord and calling upon his name and he saved you, um, you're sealed until the day of redemption, once saved, always saved, okay, right? Um, you cannot lose which that which is not yours, okay? But if you are saved and you want to engage in these pagan practices that come from Rome, that's on your head, okay? That's on your head, all right? I ain't going to call you lost because you do that, but we're going to see a lot of lost people uh, engage in these holidays that come from Rome. Because what, what, what binds all Christians together? We all believe in the Trinity. No, we don't. We all celebrate the resurrection of the Lord on a start day. No, we don't. And we all um, uh, 
Thank God for his birth. Which is on December 25th. No, we don't. And remember, what is a Christian? Someone who worships Jesus Christ. Which Jesus? There's all kinds of Jesuses. That devil, um, Charles Manson, was right. Which Jesus? There's all kinds of Jesuses. There are. Yeah. Which one are you talking about? The God, the Jesus of the Scripture, huh? Who never once told you to commemorate his birth. Okay? What he did tell us to commemorate was his death. Okay? And we're going to look at that. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 on to verse 23. Okay? What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? Now, Paul is specifically addressing a statue. But is that all an idol is? Come on! You want to say, in order to defend your paganism, you want to say, yes, an idol is only a statue. You're a liar. You're a liar. You know that an idol is more than just a statue. You know it. Even pagans and devil worshippers know that. Okay? Even they know that. Okay? I was sent a very... Dis we're we're going to see only a clip of it. Okay? Just a clip of it. I was sent a very disturbing video this morning by a dear brother. And I, I emailed him. It's like, you know, I have already showered this morning. And after watching that, I was like, man, I, I need another shower. I felt filthy, but um, it was, um, I, I, wa I watched that whole thing. We're not, we're not going to watch, and we're just going to watch a specific point of it, okay? Because several people, several brethren have brought up to me about, you know, when we, I got the OBS going, that's going to be over with here in a little bit. But um, a couple people, seven to be exact, brought it up to me about, you know, hey, Brad, you know, I understand you got to show us what you're talking about, uh, stuff like that. But, you know, when you go off on your little things, uh, you know, at least get the thing on OBS so we see you and not the video in the background. And you're right, brethren. You're right. You're right. I agree. I agree. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. But like I said, I, I was sent this video and it's just absolutely disturbing. But there's a very specific part in that video that we're going to look at. Just a, barely two minutes, okay? But, again, back to our text of scripture here. Paul is actually speaking specifically about a physical statue. But you got to remember, what did Satan say to Eve? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You are your own God. You can judge what is right and what is wrong. And man in and of himself is incapable of truly judging what is right and what is, what is good and what is evil, I should say. Excuse me, okay? The only one who can do that is God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And how do you learn what is good and what is evil? Uh, through the scriptures, okay? God is a spirit. And see, the Bibles take out the A and say God is spirit. So you can't discern which one is which unless you go to a Jesuit trained priest. Oh, excuse me, a Jesuit trained pastor to tell you what is what. When you could read the word of God, the authorized version of the scriptures yourself and say, see that God is a spirit and the spirit of truth will lead your guide to into all truth. Okay. While as the spirit of error will be contrary to the scripture. Okay? You understand? So an idol is not just a physical statue. It could be an ideology. It could be pretty much anything. But most of the time, the idol that is being worshipped nowadays is the one that you look at in the mirror. And you're going to refute that? Well, we know where your heart is. Don't we? Yeah, we do. Let's continue. Verse 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. 
and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And, here, and here's the escape clause for all these people who want to justify the satanic Roman Catholic traditions of men pagan holidays. Here's their escape clause and it cannot be refuted. It can't be. It can't be. It cannot be refuted. But here's their escape clause. It can't be. Are you happy? Are you happy? Are you happy? You are, aren't you? You are. It can't be refuted. Even though Paul kind of just did. But what does he say? All things are lawful for me. But all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. But all things edify not. There's their escape clause. While Paul just basically, from 19 on to verse 22, kind of dismantles, uh, okay, you, 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 what, you're going to eat at the table of the Lord and also at the table of devils? But yet you got to remember, all things are lawful for you. You can do that. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Does that make it right? Absolutely not. But yes. See, you got to remember, the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, Calvinist, is not a faith that is derived at gunpoint, either by God or by the devil. Okay? You have to make the right choices. And as you read in the uh, 1 Corinthians, what is it, chapter 3, that we will receive uh, for the work, for what we did in our bodies, whether it be good or bad, you know, at the judgment seat of Christ for those of us who are saved, who get redeemed before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? You as a saved man or woman, you can do these things, yes, but it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Okay? It is going to cost you. You have the liberty to do these things. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Unfortunately, because the script right there, verse 23. And brethren, there when they say, well, all things are lawful for me. They're right. But realize, realize this, dear friend. That while you are celebrating Easter. And you know, um, on that. Okay, if this is what, 33 minutes? Okay. You have questions about a start day. The Lord, a couple years ago had me to do a two-part video on Easter, Lent, and eggs, which will be in the description box where we go over it through, uh, thoroughly, okay? A couple things about that video, the videos. Uh, at that time, I was not showing my face, okay? Okay? Because I was fearing men, okay? Because of an incident that happened at the house I used to live in, okay? Also, at that time, I was ignorant. How so? I, in the, those videos about Easter, Lent, and eggs, you will hear me use the word Bible. And you will also hear me use the word Christian. At that time of, the, of those videos, I was ignorant of the truth of those things. Okay? I was ignorant. But what the Lord revealed through the scriptures, and also we go through Alexander Hislop's book, uh, The Two Babylons, about Easter. Okay? Uh, the teaching in those videos about the satanic Roman Catholic paganism of Easter and how that Easter and Acts chapter 12 is the correct wording, not Passover, which the Bibles like to do. They like to put Passover in place of Easter, trying to blend paganism with something that is actually in Scripture. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Okay, but any questions about that, about Easter versus Passover, we get into it in depth in those videos. Check those out. They will be in the description box for you. Okay, if you make it to, what, 34 minutes and are uh, still asking questions, watch those videos. Okay, if you're going to still be contentious and not watch those videos, then go away. Your comment will be blocked. Okay, adios.
All right. But now I want us to, um, we're going to look at this here, this video here. Okay. You got to remember, people, Astarte, Easter, and Christ's Mass, Christmas, are what? Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. Verses 5 on verse 13. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, what is a Pharisee? A Pharisee is someone that takes the traditions of men over Scripture. Catholics are Pharisees. Some very staunch, a lot of Christians are Pharisees, where they hold their traditions of men above Scripture. That's what a Pharisee is. Okay? That's what a Pharisee is. You are not a Pharisee if you want to align your life with Scripture as we are supposed to as ambassadors for Christ. Okay? You are not a Pharisee. You're a Pharisee if you exalt tradition over Scripture. Then you're a Pharisee. Let's continue. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders? but eat bread with unwashed hands. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Isaiah chapter 29, hold your place there, let's uh, scripture with scripture. Isaiah 29, verse, uh, verse 13. Isaiah chapter 29, not 30, verse 13. Wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. And right here our Lord says, Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men, such as Astarte and Christ's Mass that are pagan, that are Roman Catholic. Okay? So, for laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. And our Lord gives examples. As the washing of pots and cups, and many other such thing, like things ye do. And some get so petty, it's like, well, see, he's only talking about those things. But yet teachings of uh, for doctrines and commandments of men isn't doesn't incorporate these things such as Astarte and Christ's man? Boy, you really are a pagan, aren't you? Fetch out uh, going for stones trying to defend something that is not validated by scripture. But all things are lawful for you. They're, they're right, brethren. They're right. It is not an issue of your salvation, even though we're going to see, we're going to see, okay, um, that even devils worship X Mass and even make, you know, about Easter with you. And, you know, common sense, the jackrabbit and the eggs, a start day, a fertility um, ritual of the pagans. Blended with the birth, with the, you know, with the death, burial, and resurrection, and the rebirth. Okay? You know? See, they take out a star Easter from the scripture, and then they put in Passover. Trying to blend that which is pagan and make you to think that it's actually Passover that they're talking about. <clears throat> Crazy. 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 You check your Bible, friend. And if it has Easter in there, there's what? A footnote. It's actually Passover. No, it isn't. Questions? Check out the video. But we are going to address that briefly in this video. Okay? Let's continue. Okay? Verse 9. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Yeah. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whosoever, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die to death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, 
It is Corbin. What does that mean? That is to say, a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. Now, we're going to look at this video. We, I, we can't go through this whole video. We can't, brother. I, we can't. We can't. We can't. This is a, a excerpt from this Anthony Padilla who spent a day with Satanists. And, you know, the, I can't. We can't, brother. We can't. Uh, we will address what you addressed in the email sending me this link. But we can't go through that whole video, brother. I can't, you know. We can't. I mean, it's obvious. But I want to show this to you. Okay? I want to show this to you. Okay. Let me see. All right. Whoa, whoa. Ah, ah, stop. Stop. Okay. Here is this Anthony Padilla guy. Again. All right. Uh, let me get to the full screen. These are Satanists who are all humanists. These guys ought to be called humanists because, and they talk in this video about the the red guy with the horns. No. No. Satan is transformed into an angel of light. Satan is beautiful. Satan, with the, you read Ezekiel chapter 28. Satan is beautiful. Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous looking. Okay. Why do you think sin looks so good to us? Because it's all about flesh. And these devils are all, you know, saying what Satanism is. It's all about flesh. Just like Catholicism is. See, if you want to be a true Satanist, Luciferian, you would be a Roman Catholic. Okay? You would be a Roman Catholic. If you were a true Satanist, you would be a Catholic. Okay? Well, what about Masons? Well, Masons know beyond the 30s degree, they know who they are worshiping. They know that they are worshiping the son of the morning, Lucifer. Okay? Luciferians. All right? But the ultimate of Satan worship is the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? Satan wants you to believe that he's something he is not. The little the horn and the red buff guy like this devil, Anthony, whatever he said, um, is, yeah, that's not what Satan is. But, these are now, these are people who are uh, humanists, uh, they hold to the principles of Satanism. Uh, the principles of Satanism, you want to know what the, you want to know the principles of Satanism are, dear friend? Here. Here are the principles of Satanism. The Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church. Here's your principles of Satanism. Right there, pal. Okay? Right there. There's your, there's your principles of Satanism. Okay? But, okay, now these guys, check this out. Check this out. <laughs> Do you celebrate any traditional holidays from other religions? Christmas with my friends. I mean, just the yeah. act of gift giving. Christmas with my friends. Giving, but not like anything beyond that. I do celebrate Xmas. Uh now that guy, did the, okay, if you want to find this video on your own, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I'm not linking it in the description box. Not going to do it. You listen to this guy, it's like, wow. 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 What an offense to a good mustn't touchy. Uh, but, uh, it... um, it's not my, I don't really enjoy it. Really, though, in Satanism, the number one holiday that is supposed to be special is your birthday. Mm. Because it's about self. But so. And therein again about the birthdays, okay? Birthdays were celebrated by pagan kings, and the Lord has convicted me on that. Yes, he has. 
Yes, he has. Yes, he has. Okay? Yes, he has. Yes, he has. He has convicted me on that. Okay? He has. But you look in Scripture, birthdays were celebrated by Pharaoh and Herod, pagan kings. Okay? But at the very least, a <laughs> birthday is mentioned in Scripture. But that's beside the point. We're talking about the two big days to the Catholic. Let's continue. Celebrating others, that's fine. You can celebrate Christmas and Easter, and they all have pagan origins anyway. <laughs> it's not like Satanists are saying, don't celebrate Christmas because it has to do with Christ. If you want to celebrate holidays, celebrate holidays. It's really, what we do is about the indulgence of the self. So if it gives you pleasure, enjoy it. I don't... Okay, that, that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough, okay? That's enough, all right? That's enough. You get the point. You get the point. Okay, and let me go to this. Okay, you get the point. Now I'm going to end OBS and go to the video part of this and got to blend this together. So, but you got the point. All right, now we're not done with OBS and now we're to this. Okay, like I said, we're, I'm not linking that. If you want to find that by Anthony Padilla, I spent the day with Satanists. You do that on your own time. Okay, but now you got the point. Uh, they're all about self. They're the traditions of man, okay? And as I was, you know, well, Brad, you talked about birthdays. He was right on that. But see, but see, the issue here at that we're addressing is what? To Catholicism, temporal, spiritual and temporal, the two big days are Easter and Christ's Mass, okay? In Christ Mass, all right? I'm glad that my wife was born. And I'll say I'm glad you were born on the day that she was brought into this world, okay? All right? I will do that. I will do that. But see, when it comes to Easter and Christ's Mass, okay, they're pagan. They are pagan. And Easter and Christ's Mass have their origins in Rome, okay? And they're the two biggest days to the Catholic, all right? Now, this about um, Passover. Now, in Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12, okay? Acts chapter 12, verses 1 on to verse 4. Now, pay attention. Questions about this, like I told you? You want deeper stuff on this? In the description box, Easter Lenten eggs, okay? Go ahead and check those videos out. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the Christians of the church. Not a building, the people. Uh, check out Brother Alexander's videos on what a church is. Those will be in the description box as well, okay? And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Yes, the book of James that you read in the scriptures is not James, the brother of John. Okay? And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to do further to take Peter also. Very important here. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Okay? You gotta remember this about Passover. Passover was a one day event. Okay? The days of unleavened bread. Okay? Passover was one day. So when they come to verse 4, okay? The days of unleavened bread. All right? When you come to verse 4 and the Bibles put Passover in here, that's not true. It's not true. Easter was a pagan holiday, a fertility holiday. You know, the jackrabbits, you know, the phrase mating like rabbits and the egg. Okay, okay. Don't eat the chocolate eggs that come from your Easter bunny. Okay, don't do that. Okay. But then again, you got Catholicism blending that with the death, burial, and resurrection. 
with the, you know, the death res and resurrection is what we ought to commemorate and we are commanded to. But see, what Catholicism does is blending pagan with what actually is. But when you get to verse 4 here, you're reading something that is not the authorized version of the scriptures. Don't you, pastor, if you've made it this far, don't you dare, well, the Greek, which one? Which Greek? The one that's in Rome? Hmm? Huh? Which Greek? Which Greek? The Texas Receptus Greek? Which one? Which one? Okay? To hell with your, well, the Greek says, which one? Pal? Huh? See what your Jesuit education does for you. Yea, hath God said. But when you get to verse 4, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarterings of soldiers to keep him. That's a lot of soldiers. Intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Passover was a one-day event. The days of unleavened bread, okay, was not Passover. Okay? It wasn't. Easter is the right word there. And this has an asterisk here, and this probably, even in the footnotes of this, uh, probably says Passover. And this is a, this is a Cambridge. Oh, oh, thankfully, no, it doesn't say Passover. No, it doesn't. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yeah, this is a Cambridge edition, okay? But Easter is the right word, not Passover. Prove it to you, okay? Like I said, we go in great detail in the videos that will be in the description box. Go to Exodus chapter 12, but we will touch on it here for the sake of this video, okay? For the sake of this video. And this whole 40 days of Lent, which you have supposedly Protestants, uh, partaking in and see those who are adamant about defending Christ's mass wouldn't dare publicly be like well Easter too because Easter Astarte is obviously plainly quite pagan okay and Christ's mass isn't see these people who cause all the stir over Christ Mass and call people lost and then change the issue. Well, you're against liberty. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. The scripture says all things are lawful for you. If you want to be a Roman Catholic for a day, huh? Oh, you're going to pay for it. Is it right for you to yoke yourself up with the Vatican, the same that killed our Lord Jesus? Is that right for you to do? Ah, uh, no. But see, it's not an issue of force, is it? You don't know what liberty is. You don't. You don't. But Exodus chapter 12, verses 11 on to verse 20. Okay? Here is the institution of Pesach, Passover. Okay? Verses, uh, what are we reading? Verses 11 on to verse 20. Read the whole chapter at your own leisure. Okay? And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay? If you were to read verses 1 on to verse 10, you will see that the Passover, Pesach, was the beginning of, this month shall be unto you, verse 2, the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you, unto the Jew, okay, the Hebrews, okay? It starts with the Passover. Passover comes first. Then the days of unleavened bread. So when the Bibles in Acts chapter 12 verse 4 put Passover there in place of, East, of Easter, they're wrong, they're lying. Okay? Nor do you call the days of unleavened bread Easter. Astarte. A start day, okay? Easter, a start day. The fertility goddess, okay? Mating like jackrabbits, eggs, you get the point, okay? Let's 
keep reading. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And all the plagues in the book of Exodus, every single one was a judgment against all the plurality of gods of the Babylonian, Egyptian, now Roman Catholic religion. Okay? And the blood shall be to and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And remember, okay, the prefiguring of the cross. They were not looking forward to the cross in the dispensation of the law or in the dispensation of the patriarchs or in the dispensation of the Garden of Eden. Okay, they were not. All right. There are types of it, but they were not looking forward to it. Because you read Ephesians chapter 3, which we're going to read. Uh, they didn't know about it. Okay, but there were types because the blood on the on the top of the door and on the sides of the door, the top of the cross and the sides of the cross covered with blood. Okay, all right, but they were not looking forward to the cross in the Garden of Eden. Okay, that is a lie. Okay, and that they bring into so you don't rightly divide the word of truth, and they that always leads into it was faith alone from Genesis on to Revelation, which is a lie. Okay. Let's continue. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. This day. Passover, one day. But the days of unleavened bread. You see? Okay? And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whomsoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And what did they do on the first day? This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Passover was first. Then the days of unleavened bread, different. Okay? So we saw in Acts chapter 12... Then were the days of unleavened bread. Okay. So for Satan and his Jesuit uh, Jesuits who give you the Bibles to put Passover there, they're lying. Okay. Easter is the right translation. Let's continue though. Okay. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. Yes. And you Jewish people out there, come on. Okay. Some will put away leaven before the actual day of Passover. Yes, they will. But scripturally, the day of the Passover, you put leaven out of your house. Okay. And in the night is when they would kill the Passover. Okay. In the night. All right. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread, even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And in the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man may, must eat, that only may be done of you. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in the selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Some will like, well, Brad, see, the day, uh, unle the day of unleavened bread, okay, starts with Passover, okay, and the days of unleavened bread. In this selfsame day, he's talking about Passover. Passover is first with the days of unleavened bread, okay? Like I said, some will do it, put leaven out of their houses. I know some, a lot of the Hasidim, We'll do that uh, long before the actual Passover. But scripturally, Passover is coming. Okay? You put leaven out of your house. That way you can have the Passover. No leaven in your house. Okay? All right? Then the days of unleavened bread. 
And we saw already in Acts 4, in Acts chapter 12, excuse me, 1 under verse 4, that it was during the days of unleavened bread. Passover already was! Okay? And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for in the selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever, talking about the day of Passover, followed by the days of unleavened bread. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at even, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. But whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether he be stranger, whether he be a stranger or born in the land, ye shall eat nothing leavened in your in all your habitations. Shall ye eat unleavened bread? Let me read that again. Ye shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread. Again, if you have more questions about this, we get into detail in the things in uh, the videos, Easter, Lent, and Eggs, okay? Now go to Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Deuteronomy, the second giving of the law. Deuteronomy, second law. Not a second law, but the second giving of the law. Giving the law to that generation that survived the wilderness because they're... Uh, those who, uh, and like you read in Numbers chapter 13, who doubted the Lord. The Lord said, there's the promised land. Go get it. I'm with you. Let's do this. And they brought up an evil report of the land. And for 40 years, they were made to uh, go in the wilderness. That generation died. Their children were the ones going into the, to get the promised land. Hence, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, second giving of the law. Okay. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Oh no, we already we already covered that. Deuteronomy 16, verses 1 on verse 8. Observe the month of Abib, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of the out of Egypt by night. And it's at night when the Passover was killed. At the day of Passover, you get the leaven out of your house, all leaven. Come on, you Hebraic people! You know this, okay? Uh, you get the leaven out scripturally. Like I said, there are those that do it long before, but scripturally, the day of Passover, get it all at your house, okay? Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock of the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste. Because they didn't have time for the, the bread to rise. Okay, hence, you know, in haste. You know, get out, get out. Our firstborn died, go, go, you know. That thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. And there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy coast, Seven days, neither shall there anything of the, neither shall there anything of the flesh which thou sacrificest the first day at even remain until the morning. You're supposed to, you're pretty much supposed to devour that Passover lamb. Okay, well, it's supposed to be left over until the the morning, like we just saw. Okay, thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee but at the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name in. There thou shalt eat, there thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at even, at night. At the going down of the sun, at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. And thou shalt roast and eat it in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt turn in the morning and go unto thy tents. Six days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no work therein. So there, okay? The days of unleavened bread came after the Passover. And let's go back to Acts chapter 12, okay? All right? Acts chapter 12. Like I said, 
We get into great detail in the two videos the Lord gave me to do a couple of years ago on this, okay? Any more questions and tie-ins with the New Testament? Check those out, okay? Acts chapter 12, verses 1 on verse 4 again. Now about the time about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, not the one who wrote the book of James, okay? And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. We just saw about the ordinance of Passover. Unleavened bread, the Passover already was. Okay? And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarterings of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter, the pagan holiday, to bring him forth to the people. So when you got a Bible like the NIV, the ESV, the uh, New American Standard, the non-King James Version, not too sure about that, but a majority of them, uh, I don't think the Dewey Hrames puts a uh, Passover in there, okay? But um, Easter is the right translation, okay? They argue about the Greek this, the Greek that. Which Greek? Oh, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus? The one that's in Rome? Oh, the Texas Receptus. Which, which edition of that? Which one of the Texas Receptus? See, here's something that these Jesuit-trained cemeterians are telling you people. Okay? The Greek and the Hebrew are part of the seven purification that the Word of God went through. They were stepping stones to bring us the perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration Word of God in English, the authorized version. You take the authorized version and you use this to translate in other languages. You're saying everybody's got to learn English to know what God says. Right back at you, you Jesuit scum. You're saying in order to know what God really says, you have to learn Koine Greek and scriptural Hebrew. Now, the thing of communion, the thing of communion. Catholics teach, we're, sh we're shifting gears now, okay? Catholics teach you that communion or their, what is it, that the mass is a required part of your salvation, that it's a requirement. And they say that Jesus instituted um, the mass uh, at the last supper, okay? And interesting enough, they were eating the Passover dinner, the last supper. Why are you saying supper, Brad? Well, you take that from the uh, uh, authorized version of 1611 in the Gothic font, or even the Geneva Bible, which is in the Gothic font, the S's are F's, and it says supper. <laughs> but the Catholic will tell you that he instituted the Mass of the Jesuitical transubstantiation of the woody, 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 turning the cookie into flesh and the uh, wine into blood. If that were true, why didn't, uh, and I gotta, gotta reiterate this, if that were the case, why didn't he say to his disciples, okay, come on, come on, take a, take a bite out of my arm. The flesh profiteth nothing. And see, like those Satanists, Satan is all about flesh. And Catholicism is the religion of the flesh. Absolutely. And unfortunately, King James Bible-believing Christianity, which is now just another denomination, is also primarily, predominantly now about the flesh. Anything Christian is about the flesh, dear friend. That's why I'm not a Christian. But in Luke chapter 22... Verses 7 on to verse 20. Let's read this. Okay? Let's read this. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. See, Brad, it says the day of unleavened bread. Uh, it says the days of unleavened bread in Acts chapter 12 there, dear friend. And like we just discussed, and as we just saw in Exodus and Deuteronomy, 
they were to put away leaven on the day of the Passover. Okay? That's what that means. The days of unleavened bread. See, see, you take one letter away. Okay? Right? It says right there, then came the day of unleavened bread. Take putting the leaven out of your house to have the Passover, okay? The days of unleavened bread happened after. Nice try, Jesuit. Let's continue. He, okay, then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the good man of the house, the master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? The Pesach dinner, the Passover dinner, was the Last Supper. And he shall shew you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And kingdom of God right there is um, uh, spiritual. Okay? I will not eat any more thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Spiritual. And when he appeared, the uh, when he appeared to his disciples, he asked them, "Do you have any fish?" And yes, it is safe to say that gelta fish, that lovely gelta fish, was probably a part of the Passover dinner. Okay, probably. But let's continue. And he took the cup. And gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. There it is. There it is. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for the elect, for you. See, Calvinists say that about the, the last supper, that he died only for the elect. Calvinists. You know, uh, Wesley had Calvinistic principles in his Methodism. You know? Yeah. The death, burial, and resurrection is there for all to be had, but you have to go on his terms. Okay? This satanic elect and non elect of Calvinism, nonsense. Nonsense. Okay? But this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And when did the New Testament begin? I'm sure if I were to ask that uh, temporal coadjutor Jesuit pastor, when did the New Testament begin? With the birth of Jesus, at the Annunction. That's a Catholic answer. You want to know when the New Testament really began? Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Okay. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 on to verse 17. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Yes, because he kept the law perfectly. Okay, the flesh was sinful. Yes, remember, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. 
okay? But see, God manifest in flesh, kept the law perfectly, which no man could do. Hence, the flesh was sanctified, even though it was sinful. Yeah, okay? Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal capitalist spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For what does that say there? For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. And go ahead on your own time, read the rest of the chapter if you wish. Okay? So the New Testament began with the death of the testator. Death, burial, and resurrection. And see, now go to Ephesians chapter 3. What happened? Okay? Christ fulfilled the law. He was the perfect sacrifice for sins. Okay? His blood shed on the cross. Okay? The payment for our sins. Okay? But see what happened now. Okay? With the death of the testator brings in what? The New Testament. This dispensation. The time of the Gentiles. Because us Gentiles have been grafted in to the tree of the Jew. I know the time of the Gentiles appears in the book of Revelation. But see, this is the time where we, the Gentiles, have been grafted into the tree of the Jew. Okay? You want to argue and call it the church age? Uh, what about where it says in, um, what is that? I forget where that is in the scriptures uh, about how uh, the church in the wilderness talking about when they were the uh, in the wilderness and Exodus and stuff like that. Okay, church means a body of people, not a building like the Catholics and the temporal coadjutors uh, want you to believe, okay? But what happened? The dispensation changed. God does not change. No, he does not. But the way he deals with man, that changes. Hence, you have to rightly divide the word of truth, being dispensational, okay? What happened? Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 and verse 5. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. And Catholicism, you know, mystery of Babylon, is all about the mystery, that esoteric knowledge, you know, the elite, the upper echelon knowledge, and the exoteric, us uh, goyim, you know. But Catholicism, the mystery, the esoteric, right? They're all about the mystery. What is the mystery that Paul is talking about? Okay? Whereby, as I wrote afore time, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ. Oh, what is that? Which in... Don't look at me, look at that. Look at the scripture right there. In other ages, or dispensations, was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, capital S, himself. Read verse 6 as well. Excuse me. What is this mystery? Verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, the grafting in of the Jew and to, uh, of the Gentile into the tree of the Jew. That's the mystery. And you read about Acts, about in Acts, about when uh, the Jews saw the Gentiles. It's like, whoa, whoa, they're they they're they're made equal with us because the this the Holy Ghost had poured out on them. 
Remember Peter? You know, he had to have division. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. You know, what I have cleansed, call not thou common. And then Peter, it dawns on him, yeah, the Lord had to give me a vision to show that you Gentiles are being grafted in. Okay? That's the mystery. The dispensation changed with the death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? You got to rightly divide the word of truth, my friend. Or you're basically a Catholic. <laughs> okay? All right? But now, this thing about communion, okay? Christ said, we saw it. Do this in remembrance of me. Where was he going? He was going to the cross to die. So, it's not the birth of Jesus that the Lord himself instituted anything. No, do this in remembrance of me. What we call communion. What the Catholics call the Mass and which they say is salvific, pertinent unto your salvation. And remember, the Catholic can't know that they are saved, even though the scriptures in 1 John chapter 5, and also in Ephesians chapter 1, where we can know that we are once saved, always saved. No, because unto the Catholic, that's what? The sin of presumption, right? Catholic can't know that they're saved. They can't, <laughs> because they don't worship the true God anyway, okay? But we already saw in Luke chapter 22, go back there again, okay? I, I closed the scriptures on that. But Luke chapter 22, okay? Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verse 20, or no, uh, verse 19. This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Remembrance of him, the death, the death. See, true salvation, there must be a death, a death of your self-righteousness. I'm a good person, okay? I'm not that bad. God loves you, present tense. God loved and gave. God's love is at the cross. You want God's love? You got to die to your self-righteousness, not you don't repent of your sins. You couldn't do that if you tried. What you have to repent of is that you are your own God knowing good and evil, which those stupid Satanists were all about. Okay? This do in remembrance of me. We are told to commemorate the death of Jesus Christ scripturally, not his birth. But yet... Catholicism ties in with the satanic, devilish Helidae of Astarte. They even call it Easter. But see, they want to remove Easter from ah, the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, if you search the scriptures and be a Berean, you'll see that, oh, the days of unleavened bread. It's not Passover. But see, they're trying to blend. They're trying to blend. And remove the evidence that Easter is pagan. Okay? All right? But see... Catholicism, you know, Resurrection Sunday, right? We are told scripturally, okay? But it's equated with Easter, which it shouldn't be, but it is, okay? And you staunch Christ Mass defenders, where are you to defend Easter? Hmm? Hmm? Where are you? Where are you? You'd give yourself away. Because that would be way too obvious. <laughs> and you know what? If they did that, then the guys like uh, from Canada and whatnot, they'd, they'd have every right to pounce on you. And you know what? They would be right. But now let's read a little bit about communion. Communion is not salvific. Okay? Communion is not salvific, like the Catholic will tell you. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 on to the close of the chapter. Can you handle this? I know you go to a church building, a phallus house, you, 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 can, you can't handle this much. Can you, Christian? Let's read this. 
Verse 17 on the close of the chapter. Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, for the but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, see, that's a building. No, in the body, in the body, when you congregate. Again, uh, my dear brother, our brother, my best friend, Brother Alexander, his, his videos will be in the description box about church. Okay, watch those. Okay? All right. Uh, for first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, unto, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper. And one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the Christians? Or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. For this dispensation, to remember what? His death, burial, and resurrection. The death of Jesus, not the birth. Okay? Not Easter! Because Catholicism has blended Easter with actual, with uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? Not Easter. But we are to commemorate the death, burial, and resurrection. And not only on the prescribed day. You can do that every day if you chose. Okay? Because what is communion really? Let's continue reading. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Death. Not a social get-together where you got a, a Jesuit temporal coadjutor priest, oh, excuse me, pastor, body of Christ, blood of Christ, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. That's what Catholics do. Okay? But when you take communion, which you can do by yourself, by the way, which you can do by yourself, I'm going to prove it to you, you're shewing the Lord's death till he come. And we die to ourselves coming to the Lord. And we are to be dead unto what? The world. Okay? So we shew the death, the Lord, the death of the Lord till he come. Okay? And we are told to what? Mortify, put down, kill the flesh? Funny. You don't hear, didn't hear anything about that, about what stops us. Huh? Yeah, let's continue. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. What does that mean? You're doing it just to eat. You're doing it, hey, let's all have the communion. But yet, not doing it in the way of shewing the Lord's death. And also, verse 28, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. See, dear friend, dear Catholic, communion is a time of self-examination where we are shewing the death of the Lord till he come. It has to do with death. Salvation include, involves a death, 
a death of your self-righteousness. Okay? That's why we are told to commemorate it. We are also to die unto ourselves and unto the world. Okay? It's a death. It's a time of self-examination. That's what communion is. It is not salvific. It is not pertinent to your salvation. Nor today is the keeping of Passover. But I do personally believe that if you are a Hebrew, okay, of the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yeah, I do believe you should keep the Passover. Is it? Is that required for your salvation today in this dispensation? No. But you should keep it, I believe, if you're a Hebrew, a Jew. I do believe you should keep that as commanded in Scripture as a remembrance. Okay? And then, like I said, in the videos about the Passover, um, you know, which will be in the description box, how that all ties in with our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? The Passover lamb. All right? Okay? Communion is a time of self-examination. Okay? But see, to the Catholic, it's salvation. Okay? Which it is not. It's a time of examining yourself. And, of course, with that, uh, verse 28, but let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. You're doing that like he was saying. People were eating... And, and the Lord's Supper here that they were preparing differed greatly than what the Catholics do. They were actually eating, okay? As, as you would read, okay? As, you, as we have seen, they were actually eating, okay? All right? Yes, they were. Yes, they were. But see, it's a time of self-examination, okay? As we are command, told to in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and verse 8. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? How is Jesus Christ in you? He is the Holy Ghost. Okay? I've already gave, given you about the Trinity, okay? Satanic. But uh, Christ is in you, the Holy Ghost. The Lord is that spirit, okay? But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Unto who? The world and Christianity, right? For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Okay, now go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's continue. Now, verse 29. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Christianity is weak and sickly and sleep. Death. Christianity, as it is today, is of the devil. And what is a Christian but Catholic? For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Hold your place here and go to 1 Peter chapter 4. See, and a lot of people, every time, every single cotton picking time, when you hear one of these Christians say, don't judge me, every single time without an exception, <laughs> they're doing it to cover their sin. Every single time. Another one? God knows my heart. Yeah, he does. Again. Every time someone says, God knows my heart, or don't judge me, they're saying that to justify sin. We are to judge righteous judgment. And how do we know what is righteous? By reading the authorized version of the scriptures. We are to judge. Yes, we are, Christian. We are to judge. By what standard? By ourselves? Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil? No. 
but by the authorized version of the scriptures, not a Bible. Okay? But see, where does judgment begin? First Peter chapter 4, verse 17 on to verse 19. This is why communion is a time of self-examination. For the time, uh, 1 Peter 4, 17 on to verse 19. For the time has come that judgment must begin with the Christians at the house of God. Oh, and you like to say about Christians in this very chapter, okay, in verse 16, look at verse 15, what Christian is being comparable onto, grouped in with, okay? We never called ourselves Christians. The world called us that. Besides, what Christ? Drop the phrase, drop the term, brother, sister, drop it. Drop it. Let's continue. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So, see, we are to examine ourselves, okay? And in judging ourselves according to the scriptures, okay? Hence, we are able to judge others, see? Because hypocrisy, hypocritical judgment is, if I'm watching porn... And I go to someone and say, hey, you shouldn't watch porn and I'm watching porn. Hey, you shouldn't smoke cigarettes. And I'm smoking cigarettes. Hey, don't get drunk. And I'm getting drunk. Not drinking of wine. You can drink wine, just don't get drunk. But you're getting drunk. And I'm getting drunk and say don't drink to get drunk. You get the point. Hypocritical judgment is what is condemned. Not judging in altogether. Because, you know, you Christians that go to Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, and quote Metallica, not the scriptures, okay? Uh, it's all based upon judging, okay? But see, we judge ourselves first. Hence, we are able to judge others. Because we judge ourselves first. How? Through the scriptures. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. When I, when I come. And the rest will I set in order when I come. So, see, communion is a time of self-examination. A time when you remember the Lord's death and your own death. And that you are to die unto the world. And you know what? For, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and we will end this video with this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Oh... Verses 14 on verse 18. See, you can have communion by yourself because it's a time of examination. Sure, it's great to do it with brethren. You know, like when our best friend, my best friend was here, our brother Alexander, we did, we did communion. Yes, the three of us, myself, uh, my wife and brother Alexander when he was here. Yes, absolutely. I do. My wife and I will do communion occasionally. I will do it myself, by myself. Okay? Because it's a time of self-examination. Okay? Self-examination. But when you go and examine yourself, as we ought to do daily, and it's like, whoa, I'm, uh, I'm judging hypocritically, or I'm blatant living in wanton sin, and I'm going to go and... This we must remember. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 on to verse 18. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 
For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And I'm telling you, you look at some of these videos of communion in these church buildings, they all follow the same script. You know, stand up, sit down, offering or, uh, or whatever, um, news bulletins. Then they have the kids come up on the stage. And then the pastor sits there and somebody reads out of a Bible. Then a 20, 30 minute so-called sermon. Then more stand up, sit down, uh, jump down, turn around. I mean, come on. It's a joke. And the communion that you are receiving in your phallus house, your church building, is not the true communion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because... Are you, are you examining yourself or are you just going along with the crowd? And I'm telling you, brethren, people, when you Christians who are left behind, I'm telling you, Astarte and Christ's Mass are going to be really big for that man of sin, the son of perdition. Oh, yeah. I would not be surprised to find out looking down from heaven with our, with our Lord, looking down on what he's doing to the earth, and what he's allowing that man of sin, the son of perdition, to do to the earth. I would not be surprised at all to find out that that man of sin, the son of perdition. Uh, hey, Grider, it's not uh, macaroni, okay? And hey, Grider, the end times religion is not Chrislam. Ugh. Anyway, anyway, uh, I would not be surprised to find out that um, he was born on December 25th. And I wouldn't be surprised to find out that the wound that that man of sin, the son of perdition, receives and comes back to life, I would not be surprised to find out that it all co coincides with the Roman Catholic Astarte. I would not be surprised at all. You Christians, you know, who are going to get left behind. Yeah, we're going to go through the Great Tribulation. Yeah, uh, you'll see. Easter... And Christmas to that man of sin, the time, uh, that man of sin, the son of perdition, during the time of Jacob's trouble, because it's going to be extreme Roman Catholicism. That's going to be the religion of the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, uh, you watch, you watch. Yeah, Christmas and Easter to the son of perdition. Woohoo, boy! Whoopee! That's going to be really big to him. You watch. Verse fifteen. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You're going to have communion with those who are worshipping that man of sin? Who are worshipping Satan in their little buildings? Yeah. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? You're saved, born again, converted. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And the Lord is that spirit. Idols. Church buildings. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. I'm not going to call you lost if you're actually my brother or sister of the Church of the Living God and you want to partake in Easter uh, or Christ's Mass. I'm not going to call you lost. I will have nothing to do with you. You go do your thing. You need to be aware that, that it's a tradition of man. It's not based upon Scripture, okay? Uh, I, oh, loosely based, but it's not commanded, okay? What's commanded us is to remember his death, burial, and resurrection, not on Easter, okay? Not on Easter, all right? If you want to coincide it with the actual chronological pa Passover, that's your prerogative. You can have communion any day, once a day, twice a day, if you want. It's not salvific. It's a time of self-examination, okay? But Easter, Christ's Mass, are the two big days to Roman Catholicism. And we, as the Church of the Living God, ought not to be partaking in any of them. Okay? We're, we ought not to be. Okay? Sorry. And if you are, that's your problem. 
That's your problem. Because all to end, this is truth. All things are lawful for you. That's true. That's true. Because you have to make the right decision and it's not at gunpoint. Okay? So that is true. Make the right decision. Don't yoke yourself up with the Vatican. Please. Do what's right. And stay away from those things. Okay? So, that is going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching this if you do. Thank you, brother. I needed that. <laughs> and we will see you in the next video. Got to put this together now, so. Bye-bye.